My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sivasangaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Uh, today I'm going to continue a little bit more deeper on chapter 27 of Mahan's teachings on electrical energy. So just to recap, um, you know, everything in this universe has electricity, you know, including our body, you know, you know, even our thoughts are generated from electrical pulse. Everything is electricity. So just recapping what we covered the last time, so we covered that what is electricity and we showed that it has got, you know, electrons, neutrons, protons. So this is a little bit technical, but, you know, uh, you need to know what your body is made out of. And we see that, you know, um, as the electrons shift from one layer to the other, it releases energy or it absorbs energy. And that's one of the reasons why we see that everything in this universe releases energy because the potential energy converts into what we call kinetic energy, shifts from one layer to the other. And you'll see later on that we ourselves are, uh, you know, uh, have that substratums or levels. Uh, and you'll see that there are different layers of our own human existence, like every other particles in this universe. So where did we get all this, you see? So uh, uh, in the previous, um, you know, uh, satsangs, one of the earlier satsangs when we covered the universe and so on, uh, to recap back, we see that, you know, everything in this material universe, uh, you know, both space and time began with the Big Bang. And there are adequate scientific evidence that showed that um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, electrical, electromagnetic fields uh, were generated through the Big Bang. And, uh, you know, uh, the remnants of that is uh, vibrating in all the particles in the, in, in the atmosphere, uh, including in our body. So if you had an old TV, not the satellite TV, if you had an old TV with the aerial, when you switch on the TV, you will see that you know uh, the channel will be have this this you know kind of a electromagnetic field and has the sound. Sh That's actually the sound that is remnant from the Big Bang in 1978. Uh, two uh, uh, researchers from uh, Bell Laboratory won the Nobel Prize for discovering this. So we know this radiation is percolating across. Uh, the universe in every particle. What is really fascinating is that the great saints and sages, you know, thousands of years knew that this force of the universe is within all of us. And they devised ways to be able to cognize this vibration or this unarva. And you'll see that, uh, you know, this vibration or unarva or kundalini or kriya all this actually remnants from the Big Bang, and it is, you know, uh, permeating throughout the universe, including our body. And how these great saints and sages use this natural force to anchor the mind and enable the mind to decipher that force and, and you know, harness the power of that force. So we saw that that electricity, which this element or this, you know, particles are a construction of the crucibles, the beginning of that Big Bang. This is, you know, particular for our universe. There may be other universes which may have different laws of physics. Uh, we are unable to comprehend that with our material apparatus. We can probably comprehend very well our universe, but anything beyond that physics becomes very difficult, at least for us to, the mathematics is not there, the science is not there yet. But the great saints and sages uh, uh, were able to give some illumination to this. So we've got to you know, understand uh, you know, how they discovered this and what is the benefit of this. So just to take you through very quickly, uh, where did all this begin? And this is where we are going to investigate slowly like a investigator or like Sherlock Holmes to trace back where all this came from. 
So we know that, as I mentioned, Big Bang, you know, got a lot of atomic, uh, you know, uh, energy, and those atomic energy came together in to form different particles, and helium was the first, and then we scientists discovered that there are many, many elements of different combinations that have come together, and we have this, this periodic table, right? And uh, uh, every element, the elements there on the periodic table actually make up everything in this universe, including our body. And these elements, uh, you know, are powered by uh, electrical energy or electromagnetic electrical energy eventually will create a magnetic force field, and we call it electromagnetic force field. Because we are sentient beings, biological beings, we call it bioelectromagnetic field. This is a scientific term for kundalini, or kriya yoga, you know, kriya force. Or in, in a more scientific language, we have the potential force and kinetic force, different languages people use. So what we know that our body is made out of this electrical or electromagnetic or bioelectromagnetic force well. Right. So how do we become aware of this universal energy, you know, uh, and uh, and why is this really important? This is the questions that scientists ask. This is the questions that the seekers, saints, sages, sitters ask this question. What is this universe made out of? There is a force. So we call it, well, science called it electromagnetic fields. The great saints and sages, they didn't have the language. Uh, they called it, uh, you know, a God force or, you know, Punarvu, different, different languages, but they're speaking the same language. But the question is that how do we, so everybody knew there is a force that governs our universe. And if we understand that force, we understand the creator, the creation process, and all the creation, including ourselves. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes, like, or the detective work that you need to trace back. So Mahans and great saints realized that we can observe the world, we can see all these things, you know, we have electron microscopes and all those things that helps us to discover different, different things. But these seers did not have those scientific tools. So what they did was that they transformed, they realized that this creation must have this creative force from the creator. So instead of observing objects, and they observe nature very, very carefully, they observe, observe all the, the, the things that, you know, uh, outside them, the object world, very, very carefully, and then they started reflecting back. I am also an object. So which means that the creative force, the Kriya, or the Kundalini must be embedded in me. How do I realize it? Well, I can observe my body, the changes of my body, you know, when I eat, you know, I feel, you know, stronger when I don't eat. So all these elements, but at that is, that's at the gross level, right? But they want to say, okay, there must be something much more subtle. Which means that I can't just look at the surface. I have to really use some a tool called electron microscope to go through this. Or if I want to see all the energy in the particles of the greater, grander universe, I use telescope. So scientists have this tool, telescope and microscope. The great saints and sages did not have those tools. So what they realized was that now I don't have a laboratory with telescope or microscope. I am going, but I know that I am part of this universe. I am, I have an object body. I have a subtle body. So I'm going to transform my body and the software that makes my body operate as a laboratory of analysis. So they needed, but they needed a way, like how scientists would, would go through the electron microscope, focusing it, the light passing through all the molecules and atoms to be able to give you the structure of the particles that you're looking at, or the telescope that they focus to get the faintest light to be able to map up that whole galaxy. Or So they needed that focus. 
So they did what they did was that for scientists, these laboratories were had these equipments. For these Mahans and these great saints and sages, their laboratory was their body, mind, and intellect. So they say, how do I focus this from outward to the object out there to inward to understand the operations of my body, the software called mind, you know, how are thoughts generated, you know, when does the thought come, you know, what under what circumstances certain thoughts are generated. So they went inward to be able to transform their mind, the mind that is receiving all the pulsation and all the sensory things, how does it form thoughts, you know, and how is it impact my emotional state and personality. So they were not just analyzing the object, the body, they were also analyzing the mind, the intellect, and the personality. And through that analysis, uh, they were able to understand nature. They were able to understand the body. They were able to understand how the mind gets that information from the senses and how sometimes it distorts what reality means, what truth means, and how it impacts our emotional state. Under what circumstances do we become turbulent, we become you know, more calmer, and what is it that makes us, you know, step away from the turbulence to see what is real? So they develop different, different tools of inquiry, analysis, inferences, and to understand this nature, the body, the personality, the self, and all these experiences. Really fascinating, you know, exactly what a scientist would do. But these were scientists of, you know, trying to discover <clears throat> the self. So there are many techniques that, that has been used. But the most important technique that whether you are a scientist, whether you're an astrophysicist, or whether you're a microbiologist, you need to be focused. So, so the discovery can only take place if your mind is sharply focused intensively. But they realize that the ordinary human mind cannot. The ordinary human mind is always caught up with things and the, without the focus, without the sharpness, they would not be able to analyze. If you see how an electron microscope operates, the light is focused in one place and it passes through that matter and goes through the atomic structure and maps out what the true structure of that entity that you're looking at. In that same way, they needed to discover the tools that gives them the focus to scrutinize what's happening to the body, scrutinize how thoughts are generated, scrutinize every thought, right? Like a scientist. So they needed to develop techniques and for thousands of years, over the many, many years this has been passed on, they started developing different techniques. So, you know, Mahan, over the many years of, he said, ah, I am going to develop a technique to discover nature, discover, you know, the software called mind, the intellect, how the interrelationship is. So he was searching like every other saint and sages. Many different techniques over the years have been discovered. But this Mahan, you know, like a scientist, he started analyzing carefully. And he discovered this force called Kundalini. Actually, Mahan didn't call it Kundalini first. He didn't know about the word Kundalini. He realized that there was a divine force that powered our body, right? So he went in search of that, exactly like what scientists are doing. Go in search of what created this universe. What were the forces? Why were they there? What conditions created this, this, this our universe? He was searching that same question, but using his body, mind, intellect as the laboratory. 
But he realized something which is very fascinating. The normal human mind cannot do it. It's the precision, the sharpness was not there. So many years he was searching this until he met an elderly person that says, okay, you are searching everything outside. You cannot discover it. I'll show you a method. So he taught Mahana method to go inward. It was very uh, kind of a crude way of focusing the mind on the inner force. So Mahan learned that technique. You know, you'll see that, you know, in many of the tantric, um, you know, uh, schools of thought, they have different, different techniques. You know, even in our own uh, scriptures, this is written. So Mahan took this, this way of going inward to explore this universe within himself to understand nan yar you know yas who am i what is real right so he went on this pursuit and finally he got that vibration that unarve you know and he didn't call it kundali he said unarve there's different names that he had but when he started this journey he realized that the technique taught to him was very complex very difficult for an ordinary person to really understand so he put on his scientific hat and said look how can i make it if, if there's this vibration i can feel it i must devise a way to unlock it so that others can also replicate this you know part of science is that Scientists would not believe anything unless you can replicate it, right? You may get the uh, particular results, but if it's not, if you're unable to replicate it, it's of no value. So he thought about it in that way. Says, okay, I can get the vibration. How do I now develop a technique to show that if someone else practices, they too will get the vibration? So he went on this journey of that, I call it, spiritual scientific pursuit to systematize this and when he did that he says okay i have to be able to raise it and this is where the three steps of the initiation came so he looked at he analyzed it very carefully how do i raise it and he found a technique to raise it to so the question that he says that if this divine vibration the universal vibration of the creator is the source of the creation, then that vibration must be emanating in me. Similar to the Nobel laureates that won this, he says, if this vibration radiation was, you know, started during the Big Bang, that that vibration must be vibrating in everything. So they had, you know, a very fascinating and sophisticated you know, radio telescope that was able to capture. Mahan had this inner scope. He says, that vibration must be in us. Must that divine vibration or the creator's vibration must be in us. So he went searching and he developed a technique to be, he says, if it is there, it must be vibrating in our body. And there may be some parts of our body that it's vibrating at a much more intensive way because it's linked to the nerve system you know, the cells and all those neurotransmitters. He didn't call the term called neurotransmitter. He knew that there were parts of the body that, you know, if you did certain things, it could magnify. So he went on the search and he discovered this in both there are parts of the body where the nerves are converging. And when the nerves are converging, the blood flow is more intensive. You can actually feel the cells become more uh, you know, uh, intensified by the flow. He said, if I can only channel this energy at certain practices that will channel that energy to particular places, then I could elevate that force. If I can elevate that force and anchor the mind on that force, then the mind neutralizes all the material thoughts and the mind becomes focused like an electron microscope. So as the mind becomes focused, and get that experience, the intellect now has that bandwidth to be able to decipher that force. Very similar to what a scientist are doing in the electron microscope story. So he got that, able to 
bring that mind to a quietude state and we started getting that vibration both in the muladhara and here because there's nerve cells, there are neurotransmitters that he did certain techniques, certain practices that he tried, trial and error, different, different things. He got it. So he was able to bring that mind to a quietude state and in that mind when it became quiet, the bandwidth, because you're not using, wasting your energy elsewhere, the bandwidth increases. That is why in the first stage, he says, for the first two weeks, store your life force. Because when you store your life force, your level of the neurotransmitters and the chemical reactions are much more intensive. So here it is that, you know, uh, he, was he was a scientist in a different way, pursuing uh, that discovery of the creator's force within. And he was able to open this. Between the third eye, there is this, you know, various glands that because it's part of the endocrinal system, it has nerves that when you do certain practices, it raises the vibration. When that vibration goes up, the mind's frequency also changes. So in that first stage was a rising step. And suddenly he got this blissful experience because the mind was quiet, but the bandwidth of understanding that force became so clear to him. And he was so focused on that that he started feeling that sensation of the worldly life is not really important anymore because you're caught up in the spiritual realm. And then something his intellect said, well, you know, I have a body. If I don't do this, the body is going to weaken. And he realized this, that, you know, if he did this intensively, he would put his health in jeopardy. So he said, how can I bring it back, bring back the energy down so that I can strengthen? So he then tried different things to bring that energy back down through the spinal cord, all the, 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 the neurotransmitters. And what is fascinating was that when he did that, the body became more rejuvenated. And what happened was that when the force which is intensified here was brought back down, you see that the most, uh, you know, um, uh, red blood cells are in the base of the spine, right? So that is why when, you, when somebody has leukemia, they take that stem cells from that base of the spine. So when that energy was stimulated, you know, the, the blood system became more, in, you know, more nourished because of the force field. And people became more healthier. And you see that you're able to live a normal, you know, very uh, productive life. So he said, this second step is very important. And finally, uh, through research, he says, okay, you know, uh, there is an important gland in my brain. How do I bring it up here? You know, and the third step of bringing that, giving you that blissful feeling. So what he did was that this meditation method that he's, unique technique was essentially to help the mind quieten, to bring greater awareness of the force, to strengthen the body, and get a more universal experience. In that process, why was this happening? Why was he feeling, you know, greater awareness, greater connectivity, greater happiness, is that when these are stimulated, it stimulates your endocrinal systems, which releases important hormones happy hormones, calming hormones, and that, that gives the mind a sense of calm and sublimity to go deeper. And this technique then helped him to say, hey, uh, he was able to, to discover that creative force. You know, in some of the scriptures, it's called Kriya. He didn't know it was Kriya nor Kundalini. He realized this creator's force was there. And as he was initiating and giving uh, this vibration to others who came of the Hindu tradition and so on, they say, Guru, what you have discovered has been talked about for thousands of years called Kundalini. And that's how he realized that he stumbled across this force which was there described in the scriptures. That's how he called it eventually Kundalini meditation. But what is really fascinating is that when he started practicing this, and anyone who practices this will experience this, that 
slowly, slowly, the material identity takes a back seat. The spiritual identity starts emerging. This is the first step. And then what happens is that you see that when the mind masters the spiritual realm, the creative force, the mind's DNA changes to that. It becomes more universal, becomes more peaceful, more, you know, expansionary. And when you channel back to your material personality, right, your material personality starts seeing the world in a different light. And I'll explain that shortly. All that trying to discover this electrical force. That is why he gave this, this chapter 27, is that everything in this universe has the electricity. And the electricity is the DNA of that creator in this four-dimensional universe that we live in. So if we were like Sherlock Holmes, we trace back the basic building block and you trace it back, it comes back to the creator. Somewhat like a forensic uh, detective. Lah. So he was able to, the three stages of meditation was his Forensic way of discovering that creator. So what he did was that so that meditation that he taught us, you know, the mind and intellect now turns inward to become aware of the divine force that powers this body. When the mind experiences this, become aware, learns and masters this, it can channel that force within that body in the right way through right practices to reform the mind, to transition the mind from being an individual to becoming indivisible. Right? A mind that is so caught up on the mortality of the body now attains the immortality of that creative force. The mind that is so focused on the perishable part of the body now transition to the imperishability. The mind that is caught up on the finite body slowly transition to becoming infinite. This is why Swamiji says, you know, that's his intensity. He says, the inner cosmos and the external cosmos are one. When I realize this, all that starts with me. That means the creator is within me. Beautifully, he captures that, right? So what is the benefit of this? So, so great, all this is fantastic. Very similar to the question that I asked. Okay, uh, scientists have got this electron microscope and go through uh, and discover the most minutest things. What's the benefit of that? Well, using that, we were able to discover what a COVID uh, virus looked like and then what can we do to address the COVID virus or any other bacteria. So there is a benefit to this. One can ask, what is the benefit of telescope? Yes, because it now tells shows us how the galaxy forms, how black holes form, how did our universe begin, where did it all start from, how old is our universe, 13.8 billion years, and it gives us you know, the universe in spectrums and energy fields, and we see that same spectrum and energy fields within our body. So there is that interconnectivity. In that same way, what is the benefit of using the inner scope that Mahan has discovered through the three stages of meditation? Here it is, right? That electrical force or bioelectromagnetic force, what is the benefit? So this is the question I always ask. Yes, we got it, but what is it, right? And this is where through the introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation, and service to see oneself beyond one's own biology. This is what I saw in Mahan's teachings, we have layers of body, the gross body. And then we have a more subtle and causal body, right? We didn't know that. If ordinary human beings would know that. No, will not know this because they're only looking from a material, physical, bodily experience. Because all the while it's outside. So if you want pleasure or, you know, uh, desires, that's what an uh, ordinary human being goes. But you will not be able to discover that creator or the creative force through that material identity unless even scientists themselves come to a point, they say, look, 
There is nothing. I can't cognize anything. My equipments cannot do this. It has to be a subjective experience. So these Mahans start from the physical body and then move to the mind, explore the mind, go deeper, and they understand everything. So what this great master has done is that, yes, there is this different layers or substratum or levels that make who we are. He calls it in a simple word, small eye and a big eye. Big eye. Piriyanan, Siriyanan. So what did he do? Well, he realized that this there is within our personality, there is this electromagnetic force field, bioelectromagnetic force field. He calls it kundalini or unarvi. He says, if I can get the mind to focus on it and experience that, then the intellect, which is part of the mind, will be able to decipher it and say, what is this? Right? The mind's bandwidth jumps. So when the bandwidth jumps, your ability to analyze, the ability to understand, the ability to cognize, the subtle things become more easier. So through the three stages of Kundalini, Mahan was able to discover, experience this bioelectromagnetic force field. Anybody that practices Mahan's way of meditation will experience this, right? That's the first phase. So when you acquire the bioelectromagnetic, so the mind locks on to the vibration of the electromagnetic force field, something very interesting happens. You know, all the trivial things that the mind wastes energy on all drops off. You know, all the things that we are caught up on in the transitory, fleeting, temporary world slowly starts dissipating. We start asking deep questions. We start thinking deeply. Our introspective power increases. Our reflective power, reflecting back what we are experiencing, you know, our contemplation intensify and our meditation becomes better. We go deeper, right? So we see this happening over the many years of practicing. Something very interesting happens. Our moral compass is no more driven by our instinctive desires or, or you know, our gross body, but it's actually we start honing down on our spiritual compass. And I covered this in the earlier part of our satsang. If you're not sure, refer back. It starts looking at God or the creator and the self in a different light. It starts using systematic approaches to understanding what is nature, what is the body, what is the self, what is thoughts. Step by step, it starts uh, deciphering this, unpack the complexity. Ordinary human mind would not be able to do this, right? So you start using scientific and rational and systematic way to decipher this, you know, nature, human consciousness, personality. So the spiritual compass then is what starts guiding you. It's no more the things outside that is pulling you in different directions. That spiritual compass, you know, I call it the Nyanavalal Paranjodi system. Nyanavalal means that wisdom, Valal means expansion, Paranjodi is the illuminator, not the senses, but something much more innate in us, which is built in during the creation process. So I call it, this is our GPS system. So if you practice long enough, you'll be able to understand how thoughts are created, how you want to create the thoughts. You can manage the thoughts. So this is what Swamiji, over the many years, he said, ah, you see, he was able to discover this GPS leads to the big eye. And this is the part that is really fascinating. So what is the benefit of this focusing on this electrical power? Right? So we see that something very interesting happens, that when we do this, our understanding of our personality becomes more sharper, more focused. You can see that you know we understand the software that drives everything, including understanding this universe. Our consciousness becomes more, our mind becomes more embedded with this universal divine consciousness. You can feel it, actually. You can see the changes that starts happening in you. The harsh personality starts becoming more and more softer more gentler, more kinder, more seamlessly integrated. 
And this is where I say that over time, the seven core values of this enlightened personality starts starting to come in. The illumination. This is what I call the GP Mahan's qualities. What is that? You feel a sense of, you know, not caught up by this material world, this sugar dukkha, the samsaric cycles. You know, you, you become more sympathetic. As I call, you know, this is like attitude. Wow, you know, this life is awesome. You know, even though, you know, uh, the material body is limited, I have that infinite potential possibilities. You know, the gratitude is there. You know, wow, to experience as four damaged, I mean, formless, but I can experience form. Right? The gracefulness, the gentleness. So, because we manage the thoughts, we know how to create the thoughts that are gentle, graceful, you know, and that translates into what we say and our actions because we manage it, not the things from outside. Anger, we don't manage it. When you get angry, it's coming from somewhere outside that is driving me. Now it's slightly different. You have that patience, perseverance, persistence, and the practice of positivity because you have that creative force in you. You're able to create anything you want, including happiness, joy, and so on. Right? That is what the power of the creative force. The mind, when it locks on to that, nothing is impossible. Everything is impossible. Something very interesting also happens in that this is, I'm, I'm capturing Mahan's qualities, right? And this starts happening. You start mastering the art of self-realization. He says that, you know, yes, I'm in this material world, but there's something much more powerful than me. So you start, what is that? That's software called self. You start mastering it. You start unlocking the infinite potential and possibilities that is embedded in our DNA. The creative force is embedded that, right? If you are out there, in the material world, the mind is meandering in the material world, you will not be able to acquire this creative force. You become aware of the divine force. You know, you become not aware of your material personality that is caught up by sukhatukas and all the you know, felicitation of this material desires. You become aware of the divine self. Self here is seamless integration to everything. Expansion, the liberation, and the finality. I am that. I am God packaged differently. I am the creator packaged differently. Somewhat like, you know, quantum mechanics where things continuously change, but the essence is the same. So the awareness comes in. The humility, you know, wow, you know, I'm part of this greater cosmos. You know, the, the ego drops off, the material ego drops off, you see, and you start having that more universal perspective of life. And you also then have this very important qualities, right? You know, you don't, you're not caught up by sugar dukkhas, you know, you're not caught up by, you know, you're not worried about that disease, poverty, because your understanding of that becomes very different, right? You learn to accept everything. That's why Swami says, that the love, not make it, because the essence of things, it doesn't really matter, you know, in that divine state, right? This is the mind becomes aja. Can you imagine, you know, when able to have that mindset, no problem. I am everything, sugar, dukkha, everything. I am that, right? So it says that the mind becomes agile to operate at any level, no matter what the circumstances are, because nothing blemishes that creative force that the mind has been inoculated and vaccinated against. So somewhat like the COVID, right? Uh, you know, people who are not vaccinated got sick, some die, some got really, really sick. The moment they got vaccinated, you can be exposed. If your body is strong and the 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 you know the vaccine works really well, you could be exposed, but you may have a mild symptom, but you recover very quickly. In that same way, when the mind touches this creative force and inoculated or vaccinated, yes, you know, you'd still experience things, but you can come out of it very, very quickly. And finally, you acquire this nobility in thoughts, words, and actions. Because nobility means you're seeing things in a much more broader way. You know, you are seeing things in a much more universal way. And that's the transformation that happens in the human mind. That's the benefit that we get from this practice. Right? And it doesn't happen 
immediately it's as we intensify this practice, we see that the seven core values of that enlightened mind, the mind that is so fixated, the mind that is negative, become more and more expansionary and positive. That happens. This is the benefit of this meditation. Right? You become creative. But what's really interesting is that, you know, how does it benefit this material world? How does it benefit your experience here? you become aware of your spiritual capital. I keep saying this. Our mental state becomes solid. Nothing shakes us, right? You know, the state of Samatua, we're not overly caught up by sugar or dukkha. We have that calm, cool, clear state. You would experience this if you practice this. Your physical health becomes stronger, right? Your intellectual capability to understand things, cognize things becomes better. You unlock the creative force within us. We don't mortgage our intelligence to someone else or others or outsource it. We discover new ways of thinking, new ways of engaging the world, new ways of you know, having a transformative impact on others. We're able to unlock that natural capital. Natural capital is nature itself, the creative force. All of us have got something that nature's embedded in us. What is it? Only through this practice one will be able to. We build strong relational capital, social capital, able to interact with everyone. You know how powerful that is? Even the people that give you a hard time, you say, no problem, you know? I'm not going to be impacted by it. I'll engage it in a positive way. That is empowering. And you build that empowering capital, which is self-sufficiency. You, you don't need to beg for anything. You have that creative force to be able to meet all the needs of this material world and even beyond. And last thing is that you will never be poor in this material world. You may not have millions or billions of dollars, but you have enough to sustain yourself, your family, and the greater community. This is the power of understanding this bioelectromagnetic force field, this Mahans and great other teachers have taught. It's a different way of life. And this is what, you know, Swamiji finally comes up to this state where he says that, you know, this electromagnetic or the electrical force that helped him go inward, enabled him to seek that creator, discover that creator. He says, seeking, still seeking. The seeker finds himself God. So that what he has done is that he understood that this material world is full of a force called electromagnetic force. He, the whole mind itself is electromagnetic. He says, how can I use this mind, which is electromagnetic, to look inward of its own power, not outward? right? And when the mind, which is electromagnetic, focuses on the inward DNA, the mind resonates in that divine vibration. That's why you always say, Unarvu governing power, anything. So the mind, which is resonating in the past of the material things out there, you know, short-term desires. So the mind is vibrating. Now when it bends inward, it's much more subtle, much more deeper, much more universal. The mind's DNA personality changes. And as it goes further, it says, ah, it ultimately discovers the creator itself. What a fascinating, you know, uh, you know, way that this Mahan has shown. And anyone that practices this intensively, focusing on the Unar with electrical force or the Kundalini or the Kriya, the mind will have the precision of the telescope. The mind will have the precision of the microscope. Even better that the mind has so much precision to discover the creator, the creation process, and all the creations. And this is the amazing, amazing discovery of this Mahan that he made it so simple for all of us to follow. If only we followed it, you know, we would be, you know, be able to experience that Mahan in us. Sandosham.